Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yan, and today is number two in Why the Word? The object for faith for the unbeliever is Jesus Christ. The object for faith for the believer is the Word of God. And Peter's going to bring us back to a story to tell us how important the Word of God is, more important than what you see, more important than what you hear, following after the written Word of God. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. It's great to have you here today. Uh, I began yesterday talking about why the Word and talking about to you out of 2 Peter chapter 1, if you want to find that. We're taking a look at verses 1 through 21 here of 2 Peter chapter 1. And we got down through verse 5 today. We're going to have to fly through the rest of it to get through it. But in, in essence, we're coming back to after you're saved, the importance is the Word. Before you're saved, the object of faith is Jesus. Put your faith and trust in Him for salvation. After you accept Jesus, then the object of faith becomes the Word of God. Jesus spoke to those who had just received Him as Lord and Savior and says, now that you've been saved, if you'll continue in my Word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and that truth will make you free. Now, putting your faith in Jesus Christ makes you free spiritually and brings you to heaven, but there's also another freedom that comes in daily life. This is freedom for your soul to look at the circumstance of life, know what to do, and this comes by knowledge. That is discipleship. That is growing in the Word of God, and after you're born again, this is the purpose of the Word of God. Remember again, the object of faith for the unbeliever is Jesus. Don't Try to explain the word of God to him. Just give him the simple salvation message and preach it to him. After that, then he needs to start cracking open the promises of the word of God, have a study life, or as it says in uh, the first Psalm, that uh, we live in the word of God day and night and that we meditate on it day and night. We not only study it, but we think about it throughout the day. And that's where the Holy Spirit brings revelation to it. Let's take a look at verses one through five again. Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith. This is the new birth with us by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. The grace of the new birth, the peace that comes with the new birth can now be multiplied. You say, well, I thought we received all this. We do, but whatever, how powerful it was that the new birth can even be multiplied beyond that. This comes from the knowledge of the word of God. Faith in Jesus gives me uh, faith and gives me grace and gives me peace. But now God wants to multiply that as I shift from faith in Jesus to faith in the word of God. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in verse two, uh, by the knowledge of Jesus uh, Christ and of God. And his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is after salvation, the daily life and the godliness you live in. How? Through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, that's excellence, verse four, by which we have been given unto us, this is after we receive Jesus, he's called us to glory, he's called us to excellence, how do we get there? By which we have been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these exceeding great and precious promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. The corruption is still here after you're born again. The lusts are still in the world after you've been born again. The new birth brings you into the kingdom of God, but the word of God now begins to protect you and give you power against the corruption and the lust that's in the world. Psalm 119 verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Then we went to verse five, then we'll move on from here. Verse five says, for also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness, you add agape love. The top level, starting with faith down here, after your faith in Jesus Christ, he wants you to build up to the top level of walking in divine love. This is simply kind of a repeat of the things that John wrote about the apostle and the disciple that spoke so much of the love of God. Verse eight, for if these things are in you, all these different areas of growth are in you and abound or keep on increasing, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even blind, and has even forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. And we ended yesterday talking about the fact that so sadly many believers, 
that don't get into the word of God actually come to a point one day where they don't even know if they're saved or not. They live by their feelings, by their emotions. And they say, seem like God is so far away. Come back to the word of God. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He lives inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And next of all, you're born again. And the Bible says you received eternal life. Fall back on what you know, not back on what you feel. Isaiah 33, six says this wisdom, that's output of the word of God and knowledge that's input of the word of God will be the stability of your times. You want to be a stable Christian, live by the knowledge you have of the word of God and then stepping out on it in great wisdom. It becomes your stability of your times and then the strength of salvation. Notice this. How do we know that we're born again by knowledge and by wisdom and the stability of the Christian life that even if Satan came and told me I wasn't saved, I'd say, you are a liar. Bible says I'm born again. God says I'm born again. The scriptures say I'm born again. And I'm believing the scriptures over you. It is written and he'll have to flee from you like he did from Jesus. It goes on to say the fear of the Lord or reverence for the Lord is your treasure. The highest, most valuable possession you have in life is not your car, not your family, not the other treasures of life. It is your knowledge and reverence for the word of God. Let's go to verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1, and now we begin building rewards for time and eternity. Listen, heaven is not a reward. The new birth is not a reward. It is a gift. It's simply receive it. And once we receive it, then God asks us to start building uh, for rewards. There are rewards in the Christian life, but after we receive the gift of eternal life, now we can start aiming toward rewards. Why? Because rewards are what we do as Christians. We cannot get rewards as sinners. No, the first thing is you have to accept the free gift of eternal life. Once you have eternal life, the Holy Spirit living in you, now you can start shooting toward rewards. Rewards are for Christians. And Christian rewards are in heaven. There's some here on earth. There's rewards here on earth. But the mass of them will be in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10 says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election secure. You want to keep your call and the election God is for your life? Go stay with the word of God. Never forsake the word of God. It is your assurance and your foundation for everything in the Christian life. And especially of your assurity that these things belong to you. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. First John 2, 1. These things we write unto you that you sin not. Notice this. The longer you stay in the word of God, it says here, you'll never stumble. Now, have you got there yet? I haven't. I keep getting closer every day. I trust you can look at your life and say, man, have I made progress in the past 10 years? I mean, I used to, this one sin used to easily beset me. Now it doesn't. I don't even remember the last time that thing was even an appeal to me. The longer you walk with God, the better you get. But you know what? In this life, you'll never quite get there. But the point of it is you keep getting closer and closer and closer. And he says, if you'll constantly do the things of God that he always tells you the word of God, you'll never stumble. That's God's highest goal for your life that you'll never sin. First John again, 2, 1, these things I write to you that you sin not. Verse 11 goes on to say here in this verse of scripture, for so an entrance will be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it just to get you know happiness down here and see people blessed down here and other people coming to see Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm also doing it because when I get to heaven, I want to go to heaven and have an abundant entrance into I don't want to just squeak into heaven. I don't want to get through the front door and go, whew, made it into heaven. That happened when I got saved. I'm as sure in heaven. It's, it, I'm as sure as going to heaven right now as I am, you know, uh, that, you know, I'm going to go do something. Today. I mean, I know I'm going to do something today. There's certain things I'm going to do, but you know what? I know another thing. When I die, I will instantly be in heaven to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. For so an entrance will be ministered you abundantly of the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't want to just go to heaven. I want an abundant entrance. I want to be dragging with me wagon loads of gold, silver, and precious stones. Verse 12 goes on to say, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them. I want to stop right there at that phrase. You know what he's simply saying here? Pastors, ministers, we often want to preach something new. No, keep going back over the things you've covered before. Oh, it's all right to get into new things, but listen, go back and cover it again. And he says here, as a good minister of the word of God, I will not be negligent. I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, although you already know them. And what makes that happen? Well, what happens after you do that? They become established in the present truth. 
What is the present truth? Why do he call it the present truth? Because what he was saying was here, the present truth we need to be established in is the New Testament. He was writing the New Testament and he talked about the present truth that he was writing, Paul was writing, John was writing, and Luke was writing, James was writing, all these other authors of the New Testament is called the present truth. And this is meat for our dispensation, the food for our time period. The Old Testament is fine, but listen, the more you understand of the New Testament, the more the Old Old Testament makes sense. You don't study the New Testament in the light of the Old. You study the Old Testament in the light of the New. Be established in the New Testament, and that will be secure in your life so that you can properly understand the Old Testament. It's still for us today, but with the new revelation we have, we can now go back and understand the Old Covenant even better. Verse 13, yes, Peter said, I think it's right or necessary as long as I am in this tent, that's my body, to stir you up by reminding you. He says again, it's my duty to remind you over and over again. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tent, tabernacle in the King James, your body, knowing that shortly I will put off my body. And he knew he was at the point of death. Very soon he was going to die, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure to you that after my uh, departure, these things, he said, that you'll always have these things in remembrance. I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after I am gone. So what's the most important thing? After you're gone, they don't remember you. You know, if I die and people go, who is this Bob guy? I don't know. You know, it doesn't matter. What I taught was important. And that's why Peter's now saying this. Peter's simply saying, I used to think I was it. I used to think, oh man, if everybody remembered Peter's name, that would be cool. That's the things he pushed for while he was a disciple. He says, I've now come to a point in my life. I want to know that after I'm gone, you'll have the word of God to keep on being taught. I might have started you, but what keeps you going is the love of the word of God. And I want to spawn more ministers after I'm gone. So it simply comes back to this, to be mature in faith, You can't be moved by your senses. You have to be moved by the word of God. Maturity in faith is being moved by what God says, not by what your senses say, not by what your emotions say. When we come back after the break, you're gonna find out how you can have a copy of this that you can keep studying it for yourself and what a blessing it will be. And the announcer will tell you about that. But what I really wanna tell you too is when we get back, we're gonna talk more about what we have to say here. And we're gonna talk about the truth of the word of God, where it wants to lead you and how secure you can be in your life, not to be moved by your senses by your feelings, by your thoughts, but by constantly the Word of God. I'll see you right after halftime, right after the break. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the Word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, Our Wisdom. To order Importance of the Word, go to bobbyandian.com. Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. March the 7th through the 9th, Joseph Z will be joining me in a minister's conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I know it's gonna be a great blessing for you. If you're involved in any area of ministry, pastoral, teaching a class, or working in a church, but know you have a call to the ministry, I'd love to see you at the conference. Go to bobbyandian.com and find information there. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read 
and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Here in 2 Peter chapter 1, take a look with me now at verse 16. And Peter now talks about the word itself, the written word in front of them. And you know, this has only been a few years after the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the day of Pentecost. Uh, Peter's now become an old man, but I mean, we're not even one generation past the resurrection of Jesus. And already there's reports coming from the religious crowd, he really didn't rise from the dead. Oh no, that's just a fable. That's just a myth. It's kind of an analogy so we can understand things, but Jesus Christ's body is still here. No, 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 it's not. And Peter is saying here, then now they're going back and even saying, well, on the Mount of Transit, that wasn't really what happened. Oh, the multiplying of the loaves and fishes. Now, that's kind of an exaggeration, but we just wanted you to know how powerful Jesus was. Uh, we don't, we're not sure he was the son of God. In fact, we don't believe he was the son of God. He was just a great teacher. The same things we hear today. And this was already happening after. Uh, Jesus had died and the first disciples hadn't all died yet. Peter's one of them. And now we'll look what he says in verse 16. We did not follow cunningly devised fables. We did not find things. We didn't sit around and fabricate these stories and then preach them to you and then follow after. No, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power that raised him from the dead and the power that's gonna bring him back. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw these things, I was there. If there's anything Peter says I can have over you as I can tell you this, I was there. Does it make me more special? It just simply means I was there and I can tell you that story is true, I lived it. And in verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Go back with me. Let's take up this story. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. While you're finding that verse of scripture, again, let me thank you that are watching. Let me thank you as my partners. You make this possible. I stop because you know why? It's so important for me to tell you, I love you. I couldn't do this without you. You wouldn't even know the power of all the things that have happened. I don't even know what all the power is happening. There's people out there that get saved, filled with the spirit, following God, growing. They don't even report back to us, but it came through this broadcast and it came through my teaching, but it took you to back it and get me here by your faithful prayers and giving into this ministry. Thank you so much. Some of you out there have been watching for some time, even had a nudge in you from the Holy Spirit that you should be supporting me on a monthly basis. I'm not asking you how much to give. Just give as you purpose in your heart or wait for the Holy Spirit to tell you something. All I can say is I need you. I need your financial giving because there's more I'd like to do. And please, if that's you, why don't you just submit to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, and watch the blessings begin to flow. There's nothing like obeying God that brings in great income, great expectancy, great growth into your life in all different areas and eternal rewards in heaven. Temporary money bringing about eternal results. Go to my website, bobyandian.com. You find a place there where you can become a partner with me, and I'm looking forward to it. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to look at the closing verse and then take it into chapter 17, because I think the, the actually the, the separation of the two uh, chapters here is in the wrong place. It should have been one verse earlier, because the story started in the end of chapter 16. But this is when here, where Peter was talking about, we were with him on the holy mountain. Here's where it actually happened. Matthew chapter 16, look with me at verse 28. In verse 28, we're going to then go down through verse chapter 17, verse 6. And here it, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and says, assuredly, I I say to you, there are some standing here. Underline the word some if you can, right down beside it, uh, Peter, James, and John. These are the three that got to go up on the mountain with him. He says, there are some of you, so three out of the 12 got to go with him, who will not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what he's going to show them is a preview of what he's gonna look like when he comes back at the millennial reign, at the end of the tribulation, coming back in power and great glory, Matthew chapter 20 
24 and chapter 25 gives the whole outlay of this. And it says, you will actually see the son of man. He could put this way. You'll have a preview of the son of man coming in his kingdom. Look at verse one. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Here's the sum he was talking about and his brother and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. It's still today called the Mount of Transfiguration. Why? This is where Jesus gave them a preview of what he's going to look like when he comes back in his kingdom. Verse two, and he was transfigured in front of them. Wow. As they stood there looking, he just suddenly transfigured. His face began to shine like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. They probably had to put sunglasses on or block their face because the glory of God was so strong on him. This is what he will look like. In chapter 25, it's referred to there. He will come back as lightning from the east to the west. The end of chapter 24, the beginning of chapter 25 of Matthew deals with this. And when the earth is covered in intense darkness and blackness, he's gonna come back as light, as lightning from the east to the west. Every eye will see him, every knee will bow. On that date, it's gonna be too late to accept Jesus as Savior. But in the meantime, it says that he was transfigured in front of them in verse three, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to him, talking with him. These are the two witnesses of chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. Moses and Elijah, when he comes back on, in, on the earth, Moses and Elijah will have been sent before him. And there appeared Moses and Elijah to him, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, I want you to understand something. I'm sure, first of all, the disciples, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John are just standing back watching. Jesus never said, you are to participate. I simply want you to be there and see it. And so Peter said to Jesus, while Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, three tents. Let's put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I'm gonna stop and think about that. What happened was, is Jesus was talking to, again, Moses and Elijah. And as he was talking to them, he's, he's shining like the sun, all this. I don't know what they talked about. It just, they, they were talking with him. It didn't say. But listen, the moment those two appeared, Moses and Elijah, the three disciples knew exactly who they were. No name tags. I'm glad for that. No name tags in heaven. They just looked and recognized them. Never seen them before. These two died hundreds and hundreds of years before these three came along. They'd never seen them, but they recognized them. That's what heaven's gonna be like. Appeared to them. I want you to notice something. They didn't appear to Jesus, they appeared to them. Jesus saw them all the time and suddenly just whoop, right in front of them. The disciples, Moses just appeared and Elijah just appeared and they knew it. I'm sure Peter and James and John must go, oh, that's Moses, that's Elijah. And they're, ta they're talking with Jesus. And look, Peter couldn't help but interrupt. He just had to get his voice in there. Lord, it's good for us to be here. What an understatement on a mountain with Jesus and, P and uh, Moses and Elijah. Then he goes on to say, if you wish, let's make your three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I'm sure that's exactly what Jesus wanted to do, spend eternity on a mountain in a tent. I'm sure Elijah and Moses must have too. I've often wondered, did Moses look at Jesus and say, where did you get and he had to stop and think. He was gonna say, where'd you get these guys? But he had to stop and think about when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And he probably went, never mind. And I'm sure Elijah must have thought, where did you, and must have probably said, where did you get, never mind. And he remembered when he ran from the queen who said she was gonna cut his head off. Why would she say that in a note? Why did she just send somebody with a dagger to cut his head off? She was afraid of Elijah and Elijah suddenly became afraid of her and ran. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. That's the three. And suddenly a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. You know what God was saying? Peter, shut up and listen to my son. I didn't ask you here to talk. I asked you here to look and to listen. And it says in verse six, and when his disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Let's go back to second Peter chapter one and let's go to verse 19. And it says here, Peter says, I was there. I was with him on the mountain. I saw this whole thing happen. It's not a cunningly devised fable. I was there, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word proclaimed or confirmed. And the King James, I love the way the King James says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. I was there and I saw it. 
which you do well that you take heed to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arise in your hearts. He said, listen, I was there, I saw it, and yet there's something more important than me seeing it with my eyes or hearing it with my ears. I saw Jesus transfigured. I saw Moses and Elijah. I saw a cloud come over me. I heard with my ear, God speak from heaven. He said, and I was there. He says, but don't think I'm something special. We have a more sure your word of prophecy, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy, no scripture is of any private interpretation. The Greek says personal explanation. No one gave their personal explanation for this, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but by holy men who spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know what he's simply saying here? We have a more sure word of prophecy, more sure than what you can see and what you hear. Why do you fall back continually on the things you see and hear? Your senses have to be exercised to discern between good and evil, and that's understanding by discernment through the word of God the more that the word of God controls what you see and what you hear, that you filter what you see through the word, you filter what you hear through the word of God, then you begin to come to a place where you have a more sure word of prophecy. He says, I was there and saw it and heard it. You guys haven't been, but I can tell you this, you have something more important. What's more important than what you hear and see? The word of God. And he now says, you have that. Oh yeah, I was there, but you know what? You have something in your hand that's even more powerful than mine. You might right now be impressed that I was there, but it really doesn't matter. What really matters is the word of God. God has simply replaced what you see and hear through your natural mind to filter it through a brand new recreated mind, a word that, a mind that walks in maturity the word of God affecting your mind and bring you to a place where your thoughts have been renewed by the word of God. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Greek word is theonoustos. Theo meaning God, noustos meaning breath, breathing. And he simply says, all scripture was given by God's breath. The what you hold in your hand, listen, you know what's in your breath? Your life. What you have in your hand is the life of God. The word of God is the life of God. It is not some book. It's not a novel. It's not even a, it's not even you know, something where you write your own story into it. No, it's not that. It is God breathed. And the word of God doesn't contain truth. The word of God is truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God or all scripture is given by God's breath, God breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, that's bringing you back in line, for correction, and then finally instruction in righteousness, verse 17, that the man or woman of God might be complete, fully mature, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. What have I simply been saying for the last day, yesterday, and today? What have I been saying? When you get born again, the object of your faith is the word of God. You want to walk in a happiness and a joy and a fulfillment you've never had in your entire life, even from the time you were born again. I'm talking about even once you get born again, you start down the path of ultimate happiness, ultimate joy, which comes from your understanding of the word of God. Have a blessed day. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.